I'm Tyler Bates, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. Welcome back to another epic installment of the Win the Day podcast. The quote for this episode comes from Maria von Trapp and says, Music acts like a magic key to which the most tightly closed heart opens. Our guest today is Tyler Bates, one of the world's top composers, guitarists, songwriters, and record producers. Tyler has scored some of the biggest film and TV franchises like Guardians of the Galaxy and John Wick. In his spare time, he's playing to massive audiences in the world of rock music and back to the studio again, writing and producing records with artists like Bush, Marilyn Manson, and In This Moment, to name a few. In 2004, he created the menacing audio backdrop for the popular Zack Snyder reboot of Dawn of the Dead, beginning a string of nearly a dozen number ones that have contributed to a whopping $6 billion at the box office. Tyler teamed up with Zack Snyder again for the films 300, Watchmen, and Sucker Punch. His body of work then expanded to include films like Atomic Blonde, The Devil's Rejects, and The Day the Earth Stood Still, as well as TV shows like Californication, The Punisher, and The Purge. Most recently, Tyler scored the blockbuster Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw, Deadpool 2, and The Spy Who Dumped Me. In this interview, we're going to talk with Tyler about how a challenging upbringing contributed to the man he is today, his creative process for making music that matters, secrets from the films and music tours he's been a part of, and how music has played a role in how he raises his family. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life, so there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Tyler Bates. Tyler, great to see you, mate. Thanks for coming on the Win the Day show. Of course, James. It was uh, it was great meeting you uh, at Kenny Aronoff's event uh, not long ago, and I'm glad we're having this conversation today. And here we are. Hey, to, to kick it off, I wanted to know, is, is there a piece of music or a certain song that's just inspired and motivated you more than any other throughout your entire life? Well, I mean, there, there's so much. Like, I'm, I've always been uh, inspired by many you know, multiple genres of music, different types of artists. And I seem to have somehow channeled various aspects of, uh, from Sly and the Family Stone to Black Sabbath. And it's all the same to me. I mean, I understand the distinction between uh, what the intent of the music is and the stylistic uh, differences are, but I've been equally inspired by um, truly just passion, you know, artists who are passionate and who step out and and really express themselves in a very unique voice. And um, that's always been something that I felt that, that was important to me as a person was to just live like how I perceive the, the creations of, of artists who've inspired me. Do you have a hard time listening to music or watching movies as a fan after all the work that you've done in those industries? No, nah, music is magical. Um, I respect the, the dark arts of creating music <laughs> so much that of course, you know, there is part of my brain that will, uh, will kind of listen or follow along, uh, from a technical perspective in some movies, but oftentimes I can just let it go and enjoy it because, you know, you, you have to be able to receive the work of others and experience it is, is food for your own soul. Mm. Um, if your mentality is that you want to perhaps just protect your work and and to maybe you know ape the work of this person or that person or just be more concerned about what other people are doing as opposed to being uh, as opposed to being inspired by it then i don't know that doesn't work for me um i i'm inspired by people who succeed uh, people around me who I love uh, and some that I'm not even personally acquainted with. Mm. I love to see the trajectory of somebody when they've, I know they faced a challenge uh, and they've succeeded. That gives me inspiration to do the same thing mm. because as an artist, we all, you know, the more in tune we are with, uh, with ourselves, the more we're aware of our, uh, our weaknesses and our vulnerability and, uh, how 
truly uncertain the the exercise or experiment of creating can be it's mm-hmm. trial and error a lot of the time um you know i until this year i mean tom brady could always <laughs> throw a touchdown whenever he wanted to but reality is there are always intangibles at play in life and and we're not always aware of those that are even uh working inside of our mind on a given day mm-hmm. so which you know is why at the beginning of a day because i generally have a lot going on in, in each of my days um i take a second to collect my my thoughts and focus um, my priorities for the day with uh, an intent. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to have a session with someone, whether it's a director or it's a recording artist, and if we're going to write music or I'm just, you know, in the producer role, um, I really want to think about how I want to participate in that, how I'm going to help that situation be a positive experience for everyone and to, you know, achieve the goal at hand. So sounds a little cheesy, <laughs> sounds a little motivational speakery, but the reality is, is with life, it's not just with work. It's not just, you know, your sports or music or whatever. It's with your relationships. Um, you can't expect to have a, a great lasting marriage if you don't consistently recalibrate your thoughts and your attitude and, and your understanding of yourself mm-hmm. so that you can also understand uh, your partner, your kids, your friends, as they're growing and changing in life. Mm. Um, because nobody is exactly the same as they were when they were 20, when they're now 50 mm. or whatever. So uh, I think that's really important. I think it's important to also have the humility to respect the growth in people who may be uh, a generation behind us, mm. where we once saw them as... as uh, as kids or we saw them as being naive it's like we have to respect that they're having life experience and therefore they become teachers as well um so for me you know i'm 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 really open and perceptive of this and i'm very excited always when i know that i'm in the presence of other creative people Mm -hmm. there's always something to learn there's always some fun to have even in the most stressed (laughs) out situations and Oh my God, it just is almost uh, daunting just to listen to that intro that you, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a mic drop, <laughs> but to me, I'm just getting started and I almost don't even know how it all happened. How do you, do you, do you mention the intention there? Is that because you're feeling, and I know there's a lot of spots where setting that intention can be very valuable for even doing solo work, but do you feel, do you set the intention because you feel the pressure of like, hey, I'm working on an $80 million film there's a lot of you know a lot of pressure and a lot of things at stake here if i don't deliver or are you setting the intention is it a bit smaller than that more the individuality of like just how do i show up and and what am i going to do to bring the best to the table and everything else will take care of itself right if i say yes to anything whether it pays nothing it could be someone's short film or whatever or it's a 200 million dollar film i still have accepted the responsibility of being a a significantly positive uh, contributor Mm -hmm. to, to that, uh, that project or that objective. Um, I'm not unaware of the gravity or the magnitude that comes with a $200 million film. And it's it, you're then navigating a completely different uh, landscape than you are on an indie film. But for instance, if I fail at my task because I haven't done everything I can to help my collaborator collaborators do their best work, that could be the end for them. Mm. If the music doesn't deliver, people may not even understand that that's where the film or TV project or what, whatever it is, uh, fell short they might blame the lead actor's star power or or whatever and you know as a composer i'll probably get another job somewhere you know i never have been of the mentality that there's another job waiting Mm. Uh, all of us i think we share this uh this concern that that the job we're on now is perhaps the last one you know we just don't know if the phone is going to ring again and that's also what drives you to uh to do your best work and to continue to see what you're made of and, mm. and, and try and bring your best to every situation you can. But again, whether it's an indie film or it's a big movie, 
uh, I think what uh, I've learned over the years is that they are not the same. There are aspects of the process that are. But, you know, the bigger the project, the more political it is. Mm. And that requires the capacity to navigate uh, with some deft abilities and to still maintain your authenticity as a human. To not be a bullshitter and just try and placate people with whatever you think they want to hear. It's really about listening to people and gathering the the most uh, crucial information uh in order to be successful in my task yeah. you know but in the movie business especially it's it's become such a frenetic intense process regardless of how long uh say in in as a composer we're mostly engaged in post production that's after they've shot the film but by now if i you know directors will try and engage me as soon as I'm hired, which is oftentimes before they film. And so, um, I really need to think about, uh, what, what my presence, how that is going to impact their decision making. And I'm trying to also be patient and have the, the grace to, appreciate the the stress they're under so if you're directing a film you've most likely been invested in this for years and years um at least two or three years you're going to be in it right and that can bring out some of the best and some of the worst in people you know we're not all there is no training to handle the stresses that come with the job in this industry and and that changes with whatever the the composition of all the the people involved in the the creative process are and the business process, the decision making and all that. So there are many things that we have to navigate. And so oftentimes as a composer, being that we are pretty much the last bastion in the filmmaking process to perhaps uh, address any of the issues with the movie that may not completely be working or be present in a performance or the writing or the lighting or whatever it may be. Um, you're like the film sucks. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, if, if we're not feeling enough emotion here, you know, I, I, I have to figure it out. And sometimes, you know, the source material is just not great to work with yeah. or people can become unhinged, which, which I see happen from time to time. And I understand that they're under significant amount of pressure and regardless of how, they're treating me personally or what, how insane their requests happen to be, <laughs> which they can be that. Um, they're just trying to make the best thing they can. Yeah. You so know? you're all there trying to collaborate with all these people, trying to make this connection with everyone, especially the audience for the, the finished product. Uh, your journey is a truly unique one. Are there some memories or experiences from when you were younger that really helped shape the person you are today and the journey that you went on? Yeah, I think they're probably things that would be characterized as abuse now. Yeah. But um, you know, I didn't grow up without love in my life. I mean, I'm I'm so grateful that I had my mother for the time that I did. You know, she she died unfortunately when I was still a teenager, but um she was a huge inspiration uh to me in pursuing a life in music cuz she was such a music uh a music appreciator let's just put it that way and so um every tuesday is when music used to come out you know this is back last century y'all <laughs> <laughs> so we would go to the record store every tuesday and there weren't that many outlets to learn uh about every album release and it was clearly not like today where it's just a deluge of material being released daily um so we, it was kind of a ritual for us you know she'd probably buy 10 records every week you know, and I, I would save my money. I always worked jobs. Since I was 11 years old, I did a job where I was on a payroll. Besides, at that time, I was working at our on our property, which was a ranch. We boarded horses. It was a lot of labor. You know, I don't think 11-year-old kids usually know what creosote oil is and all that, <laughs> stuff, all that stuff. But, you know, I mean, that's helped me. It's helped me to not balk at an intense uh challenge with a tremendous amount of work mm. um to do you know i just get in and, and do the work but um she was great uh and, and that those times of going every tuesday to the record store really made me appreciate music just talking with the store clerks about what was coming out and and just the the excitement for even seeing a new 
album cover and that that started from as far back as i can remember i think mm-hmm. i learned to read by studying al- album liner notes with my mom and she would help me read mm-hmm. through them because i want to know who made the music who wrote it who produced <laughs> it who played on it you know so that was cool and then you know my my father had a different upbringing than my mother and it was it was uh much less refined and and uh much more physical mm. and uh i had a stepfather who was who was not not a good person you know um but what my experience uh in growing up with these these people, and yeah, I love my father. We're good, but the stepfather, you know, I, I don't know what's with him. He's really the one who's responsible for killing my mother because he was drunk driving, and he always was drunk driving, so it wasn't a surprise, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I had to go through a lot of processing when I was in my, you know, around twenty, twenty one, twenty two years old after my mother had had passed, and I was completely on my own. I didn't have money. I didn't have, you know, any support other than at the time I was working in the board of options exchange in Chicago. So I was trying to stay close to home instead of going to college. I was staying close to home to try and help my mother who had kind of lost her way the last few years of her life. And um, luckily I got a job there when I was 18 and I ended up managing the firm when I was 19. So I became like the youngest person to ever manage a trading firm in the stock market. Or board of Options Exchange, rather. Started trading stocks and options. And what I learned there besides critical thinking and strategy and and the understanding of so many people, so many types of people that I was never exposed to, because I lived way out in those sticks, you know? I mean, it wasn't like I was under a rock. Different but, world, yeah. I mean, my mom's friends were all like Rainbow Tribe, but I didn't know. <laughs> I wasn't cultured at all. So... When I went to work at this trading firm, is an all Jewish trading firm. I didn't even know what that meant, right? But they hired me, and I'm still close with everybody from back then. Hillel Singer is the man who hired me, one of my dearest friends. Mm. Uh, I talk to him frequently. My main boss, uh, Corky <laughs> Perlstein, was a great, a great uh, male role model in my life. Um, yeah. Taught me a ton about accountability. And the the reality is, is like, no matter what goes wrong in my job today, and things go wrong, or at least not as according to plan, um, you know, excuses really don't Mm. change much, you know, and it doesn't help the person you are even inclined to to deliver an excuse Mm. to. So you really just have to understand where you're at, and you have to figure out what is the most solution-oriented action I can take right now. Mm. because. The, the other just makes people more nervous, makes them less confident that we're going to get to the, the we're going to manifest the end result that we wish to, that we're aspiring toward, you know? So my job is to bring that comfort as much as it is to create the music and to conduct a process that engages everybody. Yeah. Because in other words, think I can't expect everyone to speak in musical terms to me. For sure. That's why oftentimes in meetings at the very onset, if I'm meeting with the producers and a director and studio execs, if they come to my studio and we're having a conversation, I'll be like, hang on a second. And then I'll start playing some music just off the cuff, Mm -hmm. you know, guitar, guitar, viol, piano, whatever, so that everyone now has been heard in that moment. Mm -hmm. And from there, moving forward from then, we have a dialogue. And so then people feel less um, uncomfortable trying to engage in the mm-hmm. process of talking about what they're hoping music can do for the movie or what their objectives are, or what they like. And, you know, so I'm trying to distill it. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I've, you know, there, there are big movies, some of which you mentioned um, in the introduction, <laughs> where the music review process can become a little mm-hmm. sterile. Right. It's not happening in my studio. It's happening at a studio headquarters or whatever. So we're in a room, you know, like this, but maybe a little less warm than <laughs> this nice wood backdrop happens to be. <laughs> and at some point, because it's such an intense frenetic process, I'll sense that it's time to have a live music moment. So I've brought equipment in without anyone even knowing. And if the <laughs> meeting goes pretty well, then I'll be like, okay. 
that section of the movie that we've been avoiding because it hasn't really come together yet. I'm just going to play live right now and let's just see if we can find the point of what music will serve in that sequence. And maybe that'll help us, you know, kind of galvanize our mm. thoughts, you know, and I, and there's no doubt that's, that that's inspiring if I don't screw it, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's always possible. And that's kind of a weird thing that, uh, that I think myself and people like me also mm. possess is we constantly put ourselves in really difficult situations and it's like, we hate to be there, but we want to see if we can handle it. Yeah. It's a PTSD kind of thing <laughs> that develops over time. What, what about when you move to LA for the first time? LA, everyone sees the glitz and glamour, but it's like the, the boulevard of broken dreams at the same time. For every person who's made it, there's so many other people who are never able to, to sort of reach those heights, um, especially creative people. You know, they might have to be um, waiting tables or something if they can't get their big break in entertainment or whatever it is that they, that they want to do. How was your experience moving to LA for the first time? And how confident were you in your ability to succeed? Well, I I was born here in Panorama City, and my family lived here. But my my parents separated. I don't know, fifteen times maybe as a kid. It was crazy. So my grandparents lived uh, in uh, like Valley Village. So so we would uh, my brother and I would just go visit for a while until you know the. The, the drama storm at home <laughs> kind of calmed down. So, and, and that's even when we lived in Chicago. So, um, I wasn't unaware of how unique and different it is here. But growing up, uh, just through my mother and her sister, they had a lot of music musician friends. And I, as a little kid, would go with them to some of their concerts. And I would also see how they were struggling financially and how hard it was when they weren't on stage. Um, but I, I, I also saw how amazing it was when they were on stage and it was, it seemed like it was worth it to me. It, I've never been motivated by money. Um, it sucks if you don't have any, but that's never been like a metric for me determining my personal value. And I, there's, there's so many people have so much money. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm grateful that through my journey, I've been able to earn enough to take care of my family and do some of the things that I like in life. But I'm not mm. somebody who like needs a bunch of stuff. Mm. I haven't even had like a, my own car for like a year and a half because <laughs> I don't really drive. You know, my studios yeah. are at home. My my associates who work with me are there. So yeah, who wants to drive in L.A.? That's what we're <laughs> no, I'm not into it. But I tell you, I, I mean, I knew it was. I know it was next to impossible, but I've, oh, you know, my life has always been so intensely challenging, uh, mentally, emotionally, physically. Um, my passion for music has been so strong that it's been the only way. There's never been a backup plan. I mean, when I was in the stock market, they, uh, my, my, uh, bosses offered to finance my trading career. Um, they're like, look, you're not going to succeed at music and this. So you should probably choose one because I'd kind of reached the the peak of what I could do in my post at, at that company. I can't imagine I, Tyler Bates in the in the uh, stock market world. You know, at this at this age, yeah. I'm telling you, man, I, I was so <laughs> fast at, uh, at calculating compound fractions at that point in my life. I mean, it was nuts. And you know, the the thing that was amazing about that though is I think that's part of what gave me confidence to believe that i had a shot at anything here and now when i moved back out to la i was i had been in bands my whole life and i just wanted to focus on writing with artists and producing records that's what i came back out here to do and i just started doing movies because people would meet me at parties or or wherever and say i got 500 bucks for you do my movie and i'm like okay i've never even met a person who's scored a movie let alone have i done one so i did 18 movies before i even met another person who had scored a film and I clearly did not go to school <laughs> to be a composer, but having written all the music in my bands and, and been basically the leader of the band and booking all the shows, um, doing all the artwork for our flyers and, you know, strategizing on how to 
you know, build our following. And I had success in doing that um, in Chicago. And when I came out here, I just started over in a different, with a different objective in mind. Um, but then again, you know, in those first 18 movies, I met a lot of people who never made it past those type films where they're dubbing in a converted garage, which, you know, my studio was a converted garage for a long time, you know, starting out after the second bedroom in an apartment. You know? <laughs> and I did a lot of painting gigs and stuff in my neighborhood. That's how I found my current neighborhood as I was painting uh, Patricia Arquette's house. Oh my God, uh, it would be amazing to live here someday. <laughs> so, um, but at any rate, uh, I, it's still impossible. Like, you know, you still have to, to operate with a, a sense of humility because there's so, so many talented people doing everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you just almost any TV show or movie you watch now, the music's going to be pretty special, pretty great. If it's not pretty great, it's still going to be incredibly serviceable. Whereas there were a lot of uh, faux pas, I think, that you would recognize 20 years ago. And I'm responsible for some myself. So um, that's certain. But, you know, uh, I think not ever having a backup plan, not ever having any financial support led me on down my path. I don't think that's what makes you an artist. I think we I think that's one unique advantage I think also people who come from means have a, a different type of advantage too, because they can see certain things a little more clearly by not having the pressure of eating, you know, making enough money to eat on their back. Cause I mean, I was so broke. Like when I was, my band was signed to Atlantic records in the nineties, I was so broke, but I remember being in New York, visiting my now wife, uh, and my band was stationed there. We had no money. And I was going to Rockefeller Plaza for a, a meeting with Atlantic Records. And I didn't have one dollar for the subway ride to get there. And it was, it as soon as I started walking, there was a torrential downpour. And it was like someone sprayed me with a fire hose when I walked in there. And I learned a lot that day because at the end of the meeting, and everybody was really nice. Um, and uh, at the end of that meeting, they didn't say, hey, do you need a hundred bucks? They're like, we can send you wherever you like in a town car. It's like, no, I need a dollar for the train, but I could use a meal. <laughs> and they gave us such, you know, like so little money to go on tour that we were sleeping on people's sofas and doing our own, you know, we were our own road crew. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, there's a sense of humility in doing that and, and understanding exactly where you are. And the, and while a lot of the people from my past, uh, don't understand how I cope with being an independent contractor type person, you know, because we never know if we can have another job. I know where I stand. I'm not just going to come into my job of 15 years and get a pink slip. And, mm. you know, when I was thinking I would retire there. So <laughs> this keeps you close to the bone, Yeah, keeps you, you know, uh, really focused mentally. And also you have to to succeed over time, you have to do a lot of work and maintenance on your yourself. We'll be back with the show shortly. I just want to let you in on a little secret. As you know, the win the day mentality is my life's work and I've studied it for the last 15 years. During that time, I've helped thousands of people from all over the world to win in their career, in their relationships and in their life. Well, for the last few months, I've been working behind the scenes on a special project with Success Magazine. For the first time ever, I'll be bringing you the exact blueprint that I've used to help the leaders of tomorrow to take their performance to the next level today. It's a self-study course with videos, activities, and a detailed workbook so I can personally walk you through everything. It's also highly practical, results-driven, and will transform your life like nothing else guaranteed. So if you're ready to win and win big, add your name to the wait list. Just go to jameswitt.com slash win. That's jameswitt.com slash win. You'll also find a link to that in the show notes and you'll be notified as soon as it's available. All right, let's get back to the show. I wanted to touch on that in a bit more detail, like the, the mental health struggles for people who are traveling 
constantly. I mean, even people who aren't musicians, people who are traveling for work, you're out of your routine, your immune system's down. It's easy to say yes to going out for drinks and whatever else. You're sleeping in a, a crappy hotel room. How do you, are you not keeping up with a circadian rhythm? So you're like, you're up all night and then you're sort of sleeping all day, um, which can be very, very tough for you over the, of the long term. How do, how do musicians keep a positive mental health when they're going through and obviously a lot of them don't but is, is there anyone in particular who comes to mind that you that you look at as like wow that person's doing a really good job of that or what are some things that people need to to think about i mean there are a lot of great people in my orbit right now who have have kind of you know uh struggled over time but somehow found their way and have become stronger and stronger as as people and with their discipline and um their focus on what are the more positive aspects of their life and and what's going to help them succeed creatively um you know i'm playing a concert sunday night here at the palladium is part of jerry cantrell's band jerry's uh you know, founding member of Alice in Chains, and and we worked together on his recent solo record, and I've already toured the world with him. He's my, you know, good friend. Lives across the street. Um, he's he's an an excellent example of somebody who is a great hang, somebody who ha- has a great sense of humility about himself, but is also a confident artist and knows what not to do to compromise his responsibility as an artist because he really wants to be his absolute best. And I think there's always somewhere in there uh, where your insecurities are, are fueling that, you know, every show is a litmus test, every song, every track that you record or create is a litmus test, you know, um, you just don't want to be slipping at all. You know, you want to keep that fire and you want to surround yourself with people who have the fire. And I think that's probably why Jerry and I get on so well is because like, I'm, I, I don't know if I have another summer to live, you know what I mean? And this isn't something that really popped into my mind until I was, you know, in my forties. I'm just like, you know, if, if I had a, if I found out I had a finite amount of time on this earth at this point, am I living the life I would live as opposed to the life I am living because I don't have that information? You know, if you found out you had six months to live, would you just then just go visit some places you've never been and and eat ice cream every night? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I am with people in my life whose attitude is really positive about being alive and seeking the joy in, in the talents that they've developed, the gifts that they have. Um, and we're all supportive of each other. And so the, the, you know, my inner sanctum is a really strong community of, Mm -hmm. of great people. And I think, you know, I I don't want to get into too much detail about the, the people who are in my life and have been famously in my life, but, you know, we need to, we need to really think within ourselves about how much, grace and kindness we hold for people Mm -hmm. and it's even the people we don't like Mm -hmm. even the people we think are chumps even the people that anger us you the only way to move forward in your life when you have traumas right trauma can be getting into a little car accident no one gets hurt but you know a little car accident a trauma can be someone sticking a gun in your face trauma can be getting beat up by a parental figure or something, you know, I mean, I've had everything happen. Um, but in order for that not to be the defining aspect of your life and to really consume the, the energy you need to live a positive life, a healthy life where your relationships with, with the people around you are really lasting and meaningful. I mean, you have to deal with that stuff and put it in a place where sure, maybe you have some motivation uh, in your personal life, whether it's uh, as an artist or in business or whatever it is, to show yourself that you're capable um, when people told you you weren't, you know, um, 
it's important to do enough work on yourself. And I'm not saying you have to do this with a therapist. You can, it's really a meditation, you know, reading helps because, you know, there's a lot of uh, tools you can pick up from reading certain, certain books. If a couple you've ever had is written in a book somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm just saying that I think that's important is to not be defined by your traumas, be a survivor, don't be a victim Yeah. and use it is your superpower, right? Yeah. It's not your badge, but it's this thing that lets you know you you your metal has been tested because you've graduated from that phase that you might have been in in your mental stasis, right? At one point because your life seems to be defined by so many traumatic events and I had a decade where it was just one cataclysmic thing after the next. Um and it wasn't the only period of my life where that occurred. It's had it a couple of times. But the point being is, is when you can put that in a place where it doesn't trip you up, it's not something swept under the rug, you feel more capable of taking things on, of being a positive figure in other people's lives because you possess wisdom. And the only way through it is kindness, grace, acceptance, forgiveness doesn't mean you condone any of it it just means that you found enough peace with it so that it's not diminishing your current present life experience yeah i'm so happy you shared all this this is a super powerful your your creative process what what does that look like what do you do to get into like the you mentioned intention earlier but is, is there something that you do mentally physically aside from that or, or run us through like from start to finish your, your creative process that helps you perform at your best it's kind of always happening, you know? It's like a pinched nerve that won't go away. You've had, th- you've had three ideas already this interview. <laughs> it's, it's the bane of my existence, and it's, you know, it's also awesome. Because, you know, my my creative energy is uh, it's exercised in so many different ways at this point. Movies are far different than television. Get, video games are different from that, you know? They're, Disneyland rods. The- <laughs> they're different. Songwriting is to me a very personal thing i mean i i understand pop songwriting and now there's 12 people writing every song that's on the radio it's kind of ridiculous um to me but um i think a lot of a lot of the creative uh inspiration comes from people around me like if for instance uh in the last few years i started writing music with gavin rossdale of bush you know, Gavin's been around a long time. I think by the time we wrote our first track together, I think I was the first person to co-write a Bush song, right? This is just a few years ago. But this guy's had like 40 number one or 40 top 40 hits or whatever. You know, he's 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 got an incredible body of work. And when you've had those many that many success that much success and other stuff happens in your life, you know, it can it can skew that so that it, maybe you're not feeling as satisfied by it or even the way people are, you know, they're, they're waiting uh, for the first opportunity to turn their, their backs on, on someone, even like, you know, Tom Brady's catching a bunch of hell right now. It's like, come on every t- I get it. But every time the guy takes a snap, he's continuing to write the history books. So one of my favorite quotes from him as well, he said, you know what my favorite Super Bowl ring is, the next one. That's how hungry he is to like to keep to keep doing that. I was wondering that about you as well. Like, do yeah. you you don't strike me as the kind of guy who would rest on his laurels, but at the same time, you don't want to be defined by sort of one maybe one period or one piece of work. Like, what motivates you to? Are you are you satisfied as as a creative? For me, whenever I I've written three books, whenever it's done, everyone's like, oh, it must be an amazing feeling to open the box and see the book and. It feels good, but it's almost th- – that doesn't provide the meaning for me. I actually love sort of the journey of the, the creation, that it's almost a little bit awkward at the end. I feel like, oh, it's done. It, it's almost a, there's a little feeling of emptiness once you open the box or once you know that the song's out there or something like that. How do you feel? Um, I just make more. But, yeah. for instance, like when I work with artists who are in my age range – like Jerry Cantrell, Gavin Rossdale, Marilyn Manson. Um, they have so much experience and, and they've been in the public and their own experience in different ways. 
um, that they're not even remotely objective about their own music or what they need to do because they've been told by management and record companies and publishers and, and promoters like what they should be doing. Right. And obviously it becomes a thing. It becomes a machine. You know, you have employees You're you're responsible for a lot of people at that point when you become that well known. So sometimes the judgment becomes skewed or that you become jaded, right? Because you don't believe in the possibilities because it's been so like creativity becomes so de-emphasized because everybody wants you just to make another one of those. And the movies are the same way. I mean, that's how they make movies is by using everything from other movies to make movies most of the time. So they tell Gavin Rostow, just make this arena so, again. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm great friends with his manager. And he, he said that to me when he first, you know, he wanted me to write with Gavin. I'm, and, and I'm like, dude, I'm so busy right now. I'm like, I mean, I'd love to meet the guy. And he's like, come with me to this show. So we went out to San Bernardino and we're standing up at the soundboard while Gavin's playing. And Gavin, I love him. He's a super amazingly gracious guy. Incredible chef too, by the way. And um, so we're watching and he's playing like Come Down or something, right? And Peter's just like, yeah, I need another one of those. I'm like, don't ever say that to him. <laughs> first off, I think it was Gavin told me it was the first song he ever wrote. It was the biggest hit. But I said, look, man, you want another glycerine? Let's do an orchestral piano arrangement of it. So the people who already know it will embrace that song and maybe new New fans will get into the song. Offspring did that with was it what was it gone away or, or, or what, what there was a song that they did recently. It was just like a solo piano version rather than like the I initial know. original hard rock. I didn't one. hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but the point being is like when when Gavin and I first got together. I mean we had 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 lunch just to kind of you know become acquainted. And when he walked into my studio, I was working. Uh, I just got the Maleco Downer pedal, which I just love the hell out of that thing. I, I'm such a geek for all this stuff. <laughs> and I was playing something. I wasn't even aware. I was just playing. And he's like, what are you playing? I'm like, I don't know. And I said, I don't know. I'll just keep doing this. Record it on your phone. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And so he recorded. And he said, can we use that? I'm like, yeah. I mean, if you want. And so we, the, the first song we wrote was that day. And um, so what I enjoy so much about that work, it is not about me, but it is about bringing Gavin or any artist back to the point or tapping into the, the 18 year old self, mm -hmm. the, the, the part where you do believe you can do anything, the part where you believe in your future, you know, because regardless of how financially successful you are when you're 50 or whatever, once you are, that doesn't matter so much. It's then about, am, can I be as potent or as good as I was at the pinnacle when people were, there were larger crowds coming to my shows. I was on the radio more, you know, can I do that? And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been part of the lives of many artists that at this point, I, I know that I've had a positive impact on them. And I know that it's a safe mm. place in my studio. You know, I don't, mm. I don't talk out of school there, but I, my attitude is always like, look, you've been doing this your whole life. I've been doing this my whole life. Every note of music that I write is is vetted it's mm -hmm. going through a, a a gauntlet of criticism before it's ever published <laughs> so if we can't make stuff just from the whatever we love to do together that is a single then we're screwed yeah. so let's not even think about singles let's just do whatever the hell it is that we love yeah. and i'm sure that something great is going to happen and it's like a great and, and it does out, out of all you've worked with People in thousands of different different roles. It's rare for people to have had the exposure to, to directors and musicians and so many other people behind the scenes. Out of everyone that you've worked with, who has the most interesting creative process or the most effective creative process to be able to get um, their work done? Wow, that I couldn't even begin to distill that to uh, down to even a few people. I suppose it's probably pretty deeply personal as well, right? The so two of the directors that, that I can point out right now, who I think are incredible um, in the way that they conduct a process, one being Gendy Tartakovsky, who you would know from the Hotel Transylvania movies, but also he created Dexter's Laboratory, Samurai Jack. Um, we've done a bunch of shows together, including the Primal series that's out now. Um, Gendy knows exactly what his movies or his shows 
need to the point where we, when we spot them, where we have a meeting and we discuss music and, and basically the whole point of, of whatever the show or the movie is, he'll beatbox the whole thing. And it sounds pretentious, but it's totally not. Like he's having a visceral expression um, that we record live and he pretty much sticks to it because he understands the strength in the story he's telling and the characters he's created. He's primarily animation, you know? Um, I think he's brilliant and I think he's a very gracious person, but still very firm in maintaining the integrity of his vision. He's open to ideas, but he's not going to be con, you know, his vision isn't going to be convoluted, convoluted uh, by appeasing or placating people around him. And I respect that wholeheartedly. Ty West is another one. Uh, last year we did two movies that came out. We did X and Pearl. Um, both uh, uh, were released by A24. And Ty is a very formidable uh, writer, director, editor. I just think he's a great artist. Um, he's humble, but he's confident. And he's very focused and very intense in a very good way. And I first worked with him I don't know, in 2013 or something on a movie called The Sacrament. And it's awesome that after these years, he's been working a lot and we've come together to do these couple of movies and to, to see his growth, which inspires me. But I learned from the discipline that he employs in his process and apply it to myself. I have to hold myself to the same standards. If, you know, if not somehow try and, you know, be even, even stronger um, because my role is not just music and being creative. It's also, you know, kind of like being a, a therapist or mm -hmm. confidant, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as a music person, I'm not really in, in, involved or invested in the political landscape. So I'm kind of a, a safe, freedom from, <laughs> I'm a safe place to be. And I don't, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't talk out of school. I'm not, you're not going to tell me something and then I'm going to go <laughs> tell the studio. I just, yeah. I don't do that, you know, and I think everyone does respect that i i am aware who's involved and whose interests are matter and and i address everybody but i you can't just be out there willy-nilly flying around mm -hmm. you've got to have some discipline in the way you approach your craft and and your relationships so yeah. those two guys um are fantastic i've worked with so many geniuses <laughs> it's your whole career <laughs> yeah i mean it's what, what about for you personally when you're having a day where mentally you're not there, you're having a creative block, whatever it is, but you're on deadlines. Do you have a process or is there something that you do to be able to get um, the work done or even just to sort of manage the the frustration that you might be feeling about not being able to get where you want it to be that day? Um, well, I'll tell you, I've, uh, I've been there a number of times. And, you know, many years ago, someone turned me on to uh, the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Mm -hmm. And that helped me considerably because it's, you know, it's not like a typical like self-help book, but it's really, he, he's the, the author of uh, The Legends of Bagger Vance, The Legend of Bagger Vance and Gates of Fire. And he really talks and, and ter speaks in terms that are uh, entertaining and, and, funny, but with a sense of humility and points out some very simple things within us that w if we recognize them, we can maybe more aptly uh, approach our writer's block or even our own, you know, sometimes we say we have writer's block, but maybe we're just being lazy, you know, and at some point, you know, you got to allow yourself a lazy day. Just go screw off, man. Instead of just trying to force the square peg down a round hole. But when you're on deadline, you know, a lot, a lot of the public doesn't understand when they're watching a movie that that big action sequence, that two minute thing that was written in 45 minutes. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. <laughs> People spend, you know, 45 weeks at least making a record sometimes, you know, yeah. that's, you know, it's not easy to do this. And, um, you know, you just, I, I, w Again, you just have to know like, okay, if I don't do this, I'm out. Mm -hmm. So you just, maybe there's fear, maybe there's, you know, I don't know if it's trepidation or whatever it is, but. It's, it's uh, interesting you said that because my, my resistance to when I'm doing like big writing projects, which is the uh, is predominantly what my um, 
large creative work is. It's not the resistance to actually writing. It's for me walking and standing there in front of the computer screen. I have that feeling. I know that I, I've so I've never really had sort of that traditional writer's block because the moment I'm there and I can get the the typing done, when it, I, inevitably when I revisit it the next day, it's so much better than what I thought it was. Even <laughs> if I finish the session and I'm like, that was horrific. And I look back the next day and I, I'm pleasantly surprised all the time. So it's just having the whether it's discipline or something, just to be able to sit there rather than trying to force writer's block or, as, as you said, just have a day to go to the beach and go for a surf or just have find some joy doing something else. Yeah, if you, if you, if you can honestly answer to yourself and say, I've been busting it, mm. you know, sometimes getting away from the desk, getting away from the computer screen allows your, your subconscious mind to work and solve some some problems that you were trying to figure out maybe in your writing or creative process. Um, you know, I, I will allow myself that when I have to, but you know, I'm on a clock all the time. I'm scheduled to the 15 minutes every day. And so I have to make it count um, no matter what it is. You know, I try not to waste other people's time ever. Um, but again, I just think that because I work in so many different medium and I, I've, subconsciously maybe aspired to that because I never, I, I knew early on doing movies like, okay, this is really an amazing opportunity to have a life where I'm working in, in movies, even when they were just like Roger Corman movies. I, that's where I started doing stuff like that. Um, I thought it was an incredible opportunity, but I also know because by the time I ever did a movie, I'd played, you know, over a thousand concerts. So it's like, well, doing a movie is not going to satisfy me the same way performing does. And I'm not, you know, like, uh, I'm not like the front person of any band I'm in. I'm usually like lead guitar and that's enough for me. It's fun. <laughs> um, but I try not to burden the process with my desire for everything that I need to happen here. That would be so unfair to a movie and a director to try and satisfy all of the things that that can't possibly be satisfied in working on that project because I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. So, mm. yeah, like when I was uh, doing the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, I wasn't planning on, on working with Marilyn Manson. He just happened to be uh, on Californication and I was doing the show at the time. And um, I don't know what it was. He just wouldn't leave me alone for like a year and finally my wife was just like yeah he's not gonna leave you alone you should probably have him over see if he's serious and see what he's got you know so we had a tremendous uh creative relationship and he brought out a lot of really good things in me and i think conversely i did in him as well and we had uh two very successful records and um you know i toured the world with him which was amazing to play my first arena at 48 years old <laughs> when i'd been doing it my whole life right you know so um that was that was pretty cool um but again it wouldn't be fair to burden him or burden jerry cantrell when i'm playing with jerry with my desire for my own music to be heard my and with manson i was i've written a, a lot of music so we we're playing a lot of those songs but you know it's not fair to to these artists for me to impose my personal artistic interests mm -hmm. in their thing. I'm still a guest collaborator. Mm. I'm rock star adjacent. Yeah. You know, and I'm uh, perfectly cool with it. Like Jerry <laughs> is my friend. I love him. I think he's an incredible artist. It feels great to be with everybody who's playing in the group, playing his music. I mean, we're going to add, you know, at least one song that he and I wrote for John Wick mm -hmm. two to the next leg of the tour. But, um, you're on a team with a captain mm -hmm. team with a captain. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the point being is, is that it's not fair to your, your spouse, if you have one to burden them with maybe your lack of friends outside of your marriage. You know, I mean, if you need to go, out and and party with some dudes or shoot some pool or play golf or whatever the hell it is that you do to blow off steam don't burden your partner with that don't burden your friendships with all of your own negativity i mean of 
course we all vent, but we also have to to have the presence of mind to be uplifting for other people and to welcome them in their their challenging difficult times mm. you know so i mean that's kind of how i mean i know that's a very tangential response yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to what you asked but my point being is, is like i didn't necessarily have the energy to do everything yeah. that i've done i could always just say oh man i'm busy and i was always busy yeah but if i didn't say yes to marilyn manson i would not have gone to moscow and 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 got uh you know and, and not played because we had a bomb threat and got pulled off the stage <laughs> that was our All first gig <laughs> that was our first gig and we didn't play in moscow it was hilarious i mean yeah these guys Rody the tech hands me my guitar i have a great show dude and then 20 guys in fatigues with machine guns come up on stage like Wow, that's that was, crazy. That's how it began. But <laughs> it, it was fun, you know. That's hilarious. Uh, what about as a parent with music as a growth and development tool? How have you and your wife, Lisa, been able to help use that through in your parenting journey to help raise your kids with that love of music? And how has that helped them? Um, well, they've seen it normalized. I don't do exactly what either of my daughters are interested in. However, my oldest daughter is 21 lola and she's she's a very accomplished musician and songwriter and singer and and um so jerry cantrell ha asked her to open our first tour last year so she and her band opened uh the tour and then we had a situation in our european tour where our keyboardist couldn't make the tour so he's like what are we gonna do like we need somebody who's a great singer who's a great keyboardist i'm like i don't know we just need somebody who could do whatever lola can do and he says well what about her I'm like dude she's 20 we're a bunch of dudes we're a bunch of old dudes he's like yeah i know but would you just ask her like just ask her and if she's into it then i'll, I'll ask her i don't want to pressure her and so then she ended up coming out on the road with us and did a whole european tour and she's in the band and she's you know this she's got her own thing she's doing yeah but she's playing with us this weekend and, and also on the six week tour coming up. Oh, so what a special moment. That's amazing. But yeah. yeah, I think, you know, there are just people around our house and we're not, I mean, there are a lot of people you would know, but it's not Hollywood. It's mm. very safe, chill vibe. Mm. And so it's been normalized so that they see that it's a sensible thing to embrace music and art and culture. Mm. And I think it's a travesty that art and music are not more, intensely supported in our society here in America because music is a language. I've experienced it many times in my life where I don't speak a common language with another person and we've played music together and exchanged laughs and, and emotion and been able to make a connection that you couldn't even do, you know, verbally. So I think there's so much value in that and understanding people and understanding yourself to explore so music, even if it's not your career. Yeah. So uh, it, it definitely teaches discipline as well. So yeah. to me, I think that's that's great. And I, I'm really proud of, of both my girls on their, their unique journeys. They're entirely different people and mm -hmm. after different things. But um, uh, I'm excited for them, yeah. uh, even in this TikTok world of shit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a firm believer of uh, a brick and mortar approach to developing yourself it's like if you really do the work you really create yourself as a genre then nobody can take that away from you you, mm. you then have to just find a way to connect with your audience for sure uh last question before we move into the rocket round tyler on your best day what's an affirmation that you would write on a flash card to show yourself on your worst day huh that that is a very interesting question because I don't I, I'm you know I'm I'm you know I'm always not a thousand percent secure but I I would just say you know um, I would just say remember you had a worse day before mm. I've been in in I've been in my personal life and my career I've experienced some heavy dark events and periods that I didn't know that I 
would have the strength to persevere through. And then when, you know, when I took my diaper off <laughs> and manned up about it, you know, my <laughs> wife helpfully, uh, thankfully, you know, would give me a little kick in the rear end and say, you know what, <laughs> you've been down for a minute, now go and do what you do. Mm-hmm. You know, this is how, this is, it's oxygen to me. So mm-hmm. the key is, is to not allow extraneous forces to take the sunlight out of your your view, your mm-hmm. worldview, your view of of your own potential. You know, so it, when I was assigned to Atlantic, I was 31 at the end of that deal. And there was an article coming out on my band and, and the publicist at the label asked if I wanted to state my age as 27. Like, <laughs> we're like an alternative rock band. Who gives a shit? <laughs> I, like, I am who I am. I came in on the road that I, I, I came in on and I'm not going to apologize for for it. I certainly would would do some things differently had I had the the experience or the foresight to do so. But I think maintaining your authenticity helps you when you are in those down times. Mm-hmm. You know that you you've had success as the person that you are, not as a person you were able to sort of emulate at one point mm-hmm. in time. For sure. You know, so I think that that's really important is just you know, try and become the best person you can be, work on it all the time. Yeah. Um, within yourself, you don't have to be like a walking therapy session for everybody <laughs> around you. But the point being is, is when you're in, t- in tune with that, you don't get knocked off your horse so easily. Yeah. Uh, let's now move to the rock uh, the win the day rock around 10 questions for some quick answers. You up for this one, Tyler? Yes, sir. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Okay. I wrote one down here <laughs> I because it. I knew that you're going to ask me this. I mean, never say never is so poignant. It's crazy. But uh, check this out. This is pretty good. Good stuff. Let's see if I can read my own hieroglyphics here. Okay. So Vincent Van Gogh, right? Uh, two things that remain eternally true and complement each other, in my view, are don't snuff out your inspiration and power of imagination. Don't become a slave to the model and the other. Take a model and study it for otherwise your inspiration won't take on material form. So, you know, I mean, in other Mm. words, it's like understand reality and what resonates among people. But also, once you understand that, you can be yourself and find that within yourself instead of simply just like, Oh, I like that. I'm just going to take that top line and use it for myself. I think that's so important in this this world we're in. What a quote. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Uh, definitely morning coffee. <laughs> and, you know, I've switched to iced coffee now. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm just pouring it over ice, you know. It just yeah. kind of wakes me up a little bit yeah. more and I drink less of it. It's like a cold shower in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Um. Show up for yourself. Mm. Show up always. Number four, what book do you gift the most or what book had the biggest impact on your life? Oh, I told you, The War of Art. Mm. Uh, I would say as far as a, a book that a gift, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's great. Stephen what's Preston. What's been great about that book is I've, I've given it to probably 30 people maybe. Mm. And they've come back to me and told me that they've gifted it to other people mm. who've thanked them. So yeah. I think that's pretty cool. It's not, you know. I'm trying to get him on the show this year as well, actually. Oh, Stay would, tuned. We will, we will see. That would be, a, that would be amazing. But, yeah. you know, if you want to see what you're made of, how, how, uh, how much you can handle, I think Blood Meridian is a pretty, <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty intense book to read, man. Um, Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? I think we kind of touched on it a little yeah. bit. I didn't go into the, the, the you know, the micro layers of it all yeah. but you know again it's it's recognizing you've been through things but just always know that there's other people around you who have their own experience their own horrible thing even when you're at the checkout line at the grocery store and somebody's being a real jerk who knows maybe their dog just got run over by a car you know maybe their marriage is falling apart so just again have the humility and the grace and and you know show some kindness you know yeah. you just don't know what's What's happening with everybody around you? Absolutely. Uh, number six. What's one thing you've learned about failure? Oh, it, it, if you embrace it, 
uh, you will accrue wisdom from failure. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that you can truly accrue wisdom unless you put yourself in a position to fail. Mm. Even when you succeed, there's failure. Like sometimes people tell me something that I've done is great or amazing. And I don't ever say stuff like that, but I see my failures in it. I see where, whether I made uh, weak choices or just didn't have the capacity to execute my idea um, as well as I'd liked, or I sort of, I acquiesce to someone else's ins insistence that I do something and I didn't have the energy or the determination to take that and, and get them to appreciate my exact take on what they're asking for. Usually mm -hmm. it happens on movies by the 11th hour. You're just like, whatever you want uh, mustard on your tuna sandwich. I don't care. Peanut butter. I'll put it on there. If it's going to tick the box, you know, I mean, you don't want to be sure. there. But you, you get exhausted. And as a composer, we don't have a guild or a union. So we're on the clock 24-7. Wow. I mean, and we don't get paid when we're, you know, we don't get paid more. You mm -hmm. know, pretty That's much everything result. that you start doing is just writing checks out of your own <laughs> bank account. Wow. Uh, number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Uh, I don't want to get all all emotional, but it'd be my mother. Yeah. You know, Um I mean, I have an incredible life now. Mm. My wife, my daughter, she doesn't know them. You know, they didn't know her. So yeah. that would be that'd be amazing. Yeah, I love <laughs> Getting it. all emotional. <laughs> Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life? Um, you know, God, it, it, it's, it's really the people around me. You know, it's really easy just to say, yeah, I'm in front of a computer all the time or this guitar or whatever. But, but again, the ability to, to f operate that, to fly the plane really comes from the strength and inspiration I, I gain from the people around me. Mm. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. I know you've done, getting chased off stage from a bomb, bomb threat in Moscow, then uh, you've, you've done a lot already. I'm kind of in... I haven't sat back long enough to have one. I mean, sure, I've never been to Alaska. I want to go there. Iceland and Greece, those are three places I haven't been. I've been to uh, at least more than half the countries in this world um, and performed in, in them too, which is really amazing. Uh, one of my bucket list things that I didn't realize was a bucket list item was uh, my favorite NFL team is the Tennessee Titans. Long story. Don't need to get into it. <laughs> but they uh, asked me to play the national anthem at uh, at a game there. Um, I had written their theme like in 2015. And um, that was the scariest thing I think I've ever done. Yeah. So when it was done, I determined that was a bucket list. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's was, some things you can't predict about how your life's going to turn oh out. Oh my it? God. Just imagine yeah. like, so I'm, I'm, you know, somebody <laughs> brings me up onto this huge stage and one of my guitar heroes is there like in the <laughs> box with me. And it's like, I'm about to go to death row or something. Right. And so I have this Tennessee Titans guitar that my friend, Michael Ciravolo at Schechter Guitars made for me and has the logo on it and it's cold and rainy out. And I open the case and the guitar's cold and the strings are sticky. And so I check the tuning and without a chance for an opportunity for a mental rep, I just hit the standby on my Marshall amp and I go. Ch -ch -ch. And so like the introduction you gave to me, it's like, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome Hollywood film composer, blah, 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 and Tennessee Titans super fan, Tyler Bates. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah, like, I guess I it's here? now. Here yeah. we go. That's hilarious. <laughs> that was so scary. <laughs> Final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? Um, I try and engage in an act of kindness, even if it's tiny, if it's the smallest thing. But I know it sounds like BS because don't don't get me wrong. I get pissed off. I, I get into dark spaces, but I have to remember these aspects of my conscious and subconscious mind um, to, I think, move my life forward. Mm -hmm. And and I I like I said, I never say never. And I really look for people who need help where I think I can be effective in helping them, even if it's unpopular among other people. For sure. For me to be there. We can't we can't just throw everybody away when it's it's they're no longer convenient for us to know or to to be with. 
I mean, we, we've got to show a little bit more love and a little bit more humility as, as people, I think, these days. We're so quick to destroy people. I think we need to just take a step back and understand why we're feeling the way we're feeling. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole other podcast right there. But, Round two. We'll get you yeah. back next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Tyler, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Tyler Bates Official, on Twitter at Tyler underscore Bates, and visit his website, TaylorBates.com. Again, all of that, uh, TylerBates.com, sorry, not Taylor. All of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Tyler, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me, James. <laughs> Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win The Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.